Where's it going? Oh, it is. Good. We're still on the first line. <laughs> I don't believe you. Don't ask them. They won't tell you the truth. Choose which version we'll, we'll see now. So let's uh, start out with the console app. So out of the box, you won't get the CSAP features, just to protect you. The CSAP 6 features. So you need to go and enable them. Into right click on the project. And properties and in the build, advanced and language version default, it will go to four, uh, will go to uh, four point five point two. Whereas you need to sorry, C sub five, so it will be at four point five point two. To go with C sub six, you need to select from the drop down and say C sub six, and that's it. Save that, and now we can start playing with the new features. Right, so first thing first, we'll do using. How many of you have done this? <coughs> Hello, Belgium. Which is more or less the most basic you can do? Now, you have to append console, console, console everywhere. It would be nice if there was an easy way to not do that. And although console is a very small one, there are libraries that have a, a very big reference uh, path. So one way to do that with C Sharp 6 now is introducing static usings. So if you do using static system.console, and then come here, you can either use the power of Roslyn and do that, or can just take it away. So right now I can do that, and then any method that's available through that uh, namespace is also accessible with this. Read and build. more than happy to do so. So static usings, you can reference any uh, uh, using um, DLL by doing that, and that will give you static access so you don't have to have everything in there. Auto property initializers, right? So let's do a class. How many of you know prop? Prop double tap and gives you property. So and one string. And 
Now, in the past, if you wanted to default initialize student uh, with a name, you would go do something like private. Uh, For a constructor, double tap, <coughs> and then say this equals Now rejoice, you don't have to do all that crap anymore. All you have to do is say take that piece, paste it there. And that's now exactly the same. Very quickly. So if you want to have a default date that don't want to initialize to a constructor, you can say everyone is five years old when you join school. Easy as that. It works across everything. You can even do uh, complex objects. So if you have a reference on a, another object, you can initialize that through there. Dictionary initializers. So let's do uh, So they also change the way that you initialize uh, uh, collections. Uh, I'll give you a very quick example. Okay, teachers. Is relevant because you have to find my reference? Yes, it is. There you go. In the past, we would do something like return. Maybe we would do something like and another one after that. you want to do it. Now the new way is different. It's a bit more succinct. It allows you to use accessors. So rather than that, you can say I want my key. Here the value of all the This key. Here the value of Mr. Code on the uh, house. Mr. Code, yes. <coughs> so that's a new way of initializing uh, collections. Again, you can do it with uh, complex objects if you have that. So that's a bit easier to access them rather than having to create a key value pair <coughs> for everything. Another very cool thing is your exception filter. So Something like uh, static. Here you can say when x. So you can reference that. So when ex dot message calls month. In effect, you can have anything to have a type and so on. The idea is you can filter your exceptions, and when that happens, is unless it matches on the when statement, then it will not go into the actual cuts. Now, one benefit on that is the fact that uh, you don't unwind your stack. So if you have a, a very complex path that leads you to your, uh, your exception, and suddenly you do a cache, 
then by getting into the cache, you will unwind the whole thing, and you lose a lot of information about how the exception actually originated. Whereas if you did like that, like this that I displayed here, then it means that the stack remains intact, and then it will bubble up until the point that it has to be uh, properly handled, and you can debug your code a lot easier. You can also do a lot, a lot more complex uh, catches and exceptions. So you can have multiple catches with different types of when just to uh, drive that. Another big benefit is the um, you, know, you can do a try catch and you can have async await within your try catch. Now let's say if we have a method that takes a parameter and that throws as well. So um, static parameter <coughs> and this one takes a parameter of students. Now let's make a, a string. Um, now in the past. If you wanted to do a uh, try catch and say, oh, you know what, my param uh, do a uh, new reference expression. You had to go and do uh, magic string, something like uh, my param. These days you can. Uh, alleviate that problem by saying name of and then passing the, the actual object that you want to pass in and that will be my program. <coughs> and that will actually return the, the exception. So maybe if we showcase that. I'll do uh, exception. I will pass the name. And I will help with this one. Right line, name off, in there, on the throw, and then you can so name off allows us to uh, get up, do away with all the matrix things that uh, we had to use in the past. That's the brackets. Yeah, that's the brackets. Two extra brackets next to exceptions. Too many brackets, yeah. Now remove those two. Yeah. Yeah. Let's use that one. Oh, I press something. Press anything. 
Okay. Uh, I think I have one more thing. What was the point I didn't understand? Was it in that? So the, the name of allows you to reference the any parameters that you have passed in without having to say to convert them to a string or know what that is. So if you have lots of parameters here. So this is a an object now, right? So in order to return that, you need to say, you know, my uh, you haven't supplied, uh, say, my param, okay. yeah. right? Whereas you don't have to do that. You just say my param, and you can uh, put into uh, a message. So you can say my, uh, you can say something like uh, this. No parameter provided. Something like that. Okay. Again, we introduce this semantic string, but that's, that's a limitation. Just want to demonstrate that. And finally, we have string interpolation. Um, since we're in here, let's just showcase that. If you come here, so if you wanted to, uh, I have a string here. Just, um, So with string interpolation, we can, in, in the past, we have to do something like uh, string dot format. And then you have to say that. And then you say this to <coughs> uh, that. And then pass the hello. So that was the old way of uh, passing strings into messages and referencing which uh, follows the code. Now uh, there's a new feature called string interpolation, which allows you to do away with string formats. automatically return the value so you don't have to do string the format and then reference the property it will give you that. Now if you have an int as well, say for double format it accordingly as a double and the same for dates and so on. So in effect, it gives the ability to quickly reference stuff with, and uh, the important thing is that you get autocorrection, right? And so you get the intelligence here. So you can see it pops up all the properties they have, which is quite handy. Uh, these are obviously issues with mistyping and stuff. Uh, finally, a little thing. Oh yeah, the cool stuff, that's fine. This impression is the Null conditional operator. Here, I one class feature. This will be just one property. And let's say if I add that. Back into our code here. Let's assume that we want to create a new student. New students. I'll leave it as it is, default. I will take the name out. Just like that. Now, in the past, if you wanted to uh, write something about student, then you would have to do if student. Name is Then let's uh, put the name or so on. So that was the the old way to do it. With a new way, you can say. Oh. 
thing equals students, and then dot and name. In which case, what it will do is it will say if the students have been, uh, if the student name has been, sorry, if the student is not null and the name has been initialized, then return that. Otherwise, return an empty uh, string or, uh, or nothing. And you can also chain link that and say if students have been initialized, then teacher has also been initialized, and the student's name has also been initialized. Then tell me that. The way that you link that is, it means that as soon as the, you hit the first thing that is falsy, then the code will stop executing and you'll never get a new reference again against your teacher name. So as long as that has been initialized properly, then it will return, as long as the student and the teacher have been initialized, then uh, you'll get the teacher name back. Any questions with regards to that? Let's see what we learned. So, new uh, C <coughs> 6 language version, static usings, auto property initializers, dictionary initializers, exception filters, async await and try catch, name of, string interpolation, and null condition operators for your properties and objects. Cool. Time for WPF. How many of you do WPF these days or work with XAML on Windows phones and stuff? Three. Let's make it a quick one then. <laughs> All right, okay, so again, the, the WPF editor has been uh, reworked from the ground up, uh, offering quite a few uh, new features. Let's uh, go into codes. Let me just open one of them. So one WPF file. Showcase. All right, so uh, one of the things we haven't seen and I'm going to showcase today is the pick. Uh, we'll discuss about pick afterwards as well, but now from uh, within your XAML, you can get uh, access to your uh, <coughs> to your code by doing pick definition. And that doesn't uh, force you to leave your editor. So in here you can say, All right, I want to see what the load data click does, and that presents you with uh, a non-model window, which uh, is resizable, as you can see, and allows you to quickly view and preview your code. It allows you to do changes as well. Do that. I will also change the original file so you don't have to go back and forth. It's very quick, so that's one of the things that has been added. You also get auto completion for a lot of stuff. There you go, it gives you a full version of what you can do here. And it also has two cool features that have been added. It makes the WPF editing or UI editing on the WPF editor a lot more fun. And that is. One of them is called Live Writer. You get two windows. One is called Live Visual T, and the other one is called Live Property Explorer. And let's see quickly what they do. Anybody that has worked with the web will probably uh, understand what we're talking here. So by clicking on the little uh, icon here at the top, it allows you to select stuff from your WPF form. Uh, and then by clicking this, it will present your icon <coughs> in the video so you know exactly when the hierarchy exists. But it also allows you to do the Live Property Explorer, which also lets you edit stuff. So as we work on the editor, uh, text box, folder. just put them side by side so you can see what it is. Yeah. So you can see as I click through stuff, it, uh, it highlights the appropriate item in the, in the controller. And then if I present the live property, you can change stuff in real time. So while the application is running, you can do something like this. In effect, it's web tools brought to WPF. And you can change stuff in real time. You can see how they, they uh, reflect. And then you can save them or uh, discard them as you feel like it. And that's a very big asset. It means they don't have to stop and restart all the time. Right, so we did WPF, that was a quick one. And I think we're good to move into our debugging stuff. Uh, we have a bit more time, uh, about 15 more minutes. Any questions so far? Okay. Good. Right. Okay. 
So let's go into our action. So I'll drop this. That's one. Does this work <coughs> with WPF, but also with uh, Windows 10 apps? Yes, anything has XAML. All the XAML letters within Visual Studio have been improved. There's also a lot of improvements within uh, Blend, but I will not have enough time to get to that now. All right, so as you can see here, there's an issue with my message. It should say hello, Visual, but it doesn't. So let's just fix that, stop the provider. Now, um, there's a way to change how we start up a, a project. And that's in the build, if you go here, uh, sorry, in the debug, in the last parameter, so you can say conference, save that, and go back to solution. Oh, there you go, that's working fine, so we'll fix that one. Okay, so first thing first, load data. So the load data doesn't do anything visual, it doesn't do the breakpoint. So it's all the breakpoint here. Yeah? Uh, so let me just do right, I'll stop that. Now you can see there's a lot of code over here, I don't know exactly where to go. One very easy way to find that, where am I? Toolbox. Toolbars. Okay, so here. One very easy way to uh, go to your entry point if you have my code only is to give or kick off a debug session by doing either a step into or a step over. By clicking on any of these buttons, it will take you to the entry point of your application so you can quickly see what's the first thing that gets hit rather than doing uh, start with debug and so on. So that's a very easy way to do so. And the first thing I want to do is put a breakpoint onto my. Oh, I know why it didn't work. If you if you ever work with the visual uh, the live uh, right data, if you don't uh, untick that one, then your code is not going to work, and you're going to uh, work out uh, sorry, ten minutes trying to figure out why things are not being hit. So there you go. One very easy way to do uh, breakpoints is rather than you inserting breakpoints on different places, if you know that you want to always stop at one place to uh, verify your code, you can temporarily put the debugger.break, which is a very easy way to set up a breakpoint code, and that will be remembered across sessions. Now, uh, one important thing is that it's very easy to do it. It will only be executed if the debugger is attached. But can anybody tell me why we need to put the debugger attached at the top? Right, so if you are working your code and, you, and you're doing work, is fine. You have your debugger attached, your business is there. If you deploy that code to production without having debuggers attached, then what the debugger break is actually throwing a, a custom exception in the code, and that will crash the application. So if you are ever going to use debugger break, make sure that you wrap it in a nice debugger is attached. Otherwise, it will crash your application. Because that's one thing, right? Okay, so we are here. First one. And let's do a breakpoint into my. One thing that we need to look into is uh, the visualizers in Visual Studio. Visual Studio 2015 includes six different visualizers for your data. By default, we have the string one, so when you hover over your properties and your tooltip, and then you click on the, oh, I want to do the one at the show, and you click on one, say, application JSON property, then you get this massive chunk of uh, uh, JSON, which is not really truly that readable. There is now a JSON uh, data provider, which uh, will wrap your object in a very nice JSON readable format. You can also do a search here, and it will highlight all the all, uh, properties within your objects and like that. You can do Control C, Control A on this one, so you can't copy stuff from here because it's a custom visualizer. The other visualizers are XML. You get a very nice XML visualizer here. It will do its best to format the XML into a format that can be read. It will autocomplete and do line returns as well. Um, you have an HTML uh, 
provider. So this one will actually use the installed <coughs> version of IE on your machine to display the data. So if you have IE 9 or IE 10 or IE 11, then it will use that engine to display that. So it's not a, a, a custom web view that you might be looking at. Then, so and the default one is string, so we saw four of them. The other one is the data set, which allows you to uh, visualize data sets uh, in here. If you have multiple tables, you also get access to the other tables. So in effect, you have to drill down into your data sets to see what's there. There's a very quick visualizer here. Okay, you can resize these, there you go. And finally, we have the WPF visualizer. So if you go into uh, authors, um, this, Here, WPF3 visualizer. Again, that's the same one as the one we saw before, but it has a bit more information and you can get the actual window here. So, okay. so that's one way to uh, kick off the debugger as we saw here. Another way to do so is by uh, stop the session. So if you know exactly where you want to stop, you can say right click here and go to, sorry, uh, run to cursor. So that will again kick off another um, debug session and it will take you all the way to your. I am pressing the last one. And so there you go. So it will stop here. It sets a, a one time a breakpoint in memory. So you won't see the breakpoint here, but it will stop exactly at the point that you set the round to cursor. So let me just put a breakpoint here. Uh, now, you know they can do debug again, so click here. If you want to see the results from your methods, now we, have, we call three methods here. You want to know what they uh, return. The authors window now has a very good uh, view of uh, what the data is, so let me just do that. So we have three methods, and they, uh, you get exactly what they return. Which is quite nice. You get this in the same the autos, uh, autos and locals. So they do exactly whichever one you prefer, you get the same uh, kind of functionality. If you let's move up now, how many of you know the move cursor back to so that, that takes you the debugger back to the step that you want to define. You can also do uh, set next statement. So in effect that will uh, do the same thing as set next statement. So you can either do it by right clicking and saying set next statement to wherever you want. So if you want to go from here to here, then it will jump the code if you want, don't want to execute a, a block of code. But if you want to replace something and you don't want to stop and restart, then you can quickly do that. As long as you, you're within the same stack trace. Otherwise, if you go out of context, then it's not easy to go back. So let me just run here, I'm to cursor do that. Uh, we have a break one here now. If we want to, in the past, we'll do F11 and go into greeting and then come out and then go into conference and come out and get punctuation. But if I want to jump straight into punctuation, there's a new feature now called uh, step into specific. And you get a nice window here that uh, asks you which one do you want to jump into. So let's say I want to go into get punctuation. And that will take you straight into that method. So you don't have to execute every single one of them to go to the right one you want. And if you want to come out, right, for those ones that are not aware, you can do control of like, shift F11, and it will take you back out to where you came from. So you don't have to go through the whole execution if you don't want to. If you by mistake step into something, uh, that's it. Oh yeah, another way to uh, come out of things is to, to start. So if we are in, say if we're going to step into specific, uh, this one, and I want to backtrack, we can do, you can do it for the call stack. You can just say, uh, right click to the method that you want to go, and then say run to pressure, and that will take you back out again. So that's another way to, to do the same functionality. Next. I'm going to break. You don't want visualizer reads. Uh, 
Oh, right, okay. So I'll stop down there. And I'll take the paper out. I'll come down here to the ups. Start again. Another cool feature is visualizing your uh, data. So right now we have apps, we have 25 apps, but I don't get information that is quite handy for me to really use when I zero really into that. One new feature that has been added is called, uh, I'll do a big definition for this one, just see how it works. There's another uh, new annotation called debugger display. And in here, you can pass a normal string and say my app ID is equal to. And then you can do smart annotation here. And then this will give you uh, intelligence. Unfortunately, we don't get intelligence because I'm running code. now will give us a bit more information about what we see when we hover over the tooltip. If I go here, you see the app ID plus a number next to it, so it gives you more information. In the past we had to do to override the two string and then pass the parameters you want to do if you want to view that, but now you, with annotations you don't have to do that anymore, you can pass as many parameters and create a custom string, which gives you a very easy way to view into your objects, especially on collections, without having to drill down into every single property. So if there's a property that you want to see, then that's a good way to do it. Uh, another quick way to do stuff is pinning uh, properties. I don't know how many of you used it before. Now, if you, if you pin something over here, then it also gives you a very easy way to view things without having to do annotations. <coughs> so here now you can see this mobile stuff. And as you, as you execute the code or as you go through, maybe that's not a good example, I'll come down here and I'll do it on the app because I think that's a very common one. I'll do the app ID. Yeah. As you, you can move it any way you want, and as you go through your uh, iteration, you see change, values change. Now you can also do comments. And do that. And then if you stop your debugging session, then you might think that this is gone, but it's not. There's a very small and um, almost non-visible blue pin over here that allows you to go back into the last property that was saved by the debugger and see that if you need to <coughs> reference to your uh, pin properties. Pin properties don't come along with you when you uh, when you work with code, but there's a cool way to do so. As you move through uh, methods and you, you lose your uh, context, and you come out of your stack trace, then your pins will obviously become ineffective. But now, there's a way to do so. If you want to pin that, move it up there. You can actually move them anywhere you want. And right click on them and say, oh, make object ID. I think I was pinning it out. If you make object ID there, you'll see there's a small dollar value. There's a small dollar value here. That actually is a pseudo variable that allows you to reference that uh, value from anywhere. So if you do uh, watch and do dollar one, that will return the object that you have uh, pin. That object ID is uh, unique across the whole session. So if you take that throughout your stack test, you'll still be able to reference that dollar one and you can always see your objects. <coughs> Any questions before I move on? So uh, that one, you can add watches here. So if I go to add watch, 
here, you can also add what you see here. And you can add what you see on the same thing. So if you want to get multiple watches across multiple levels, if, if it goes three levels deep, deep, you can still add them as a, a watch, which is quite handy. That's the first one, run tests. Um, that's a very good way to, to demo something. So in here we see that the desktop has failed to get any counters back on my tests. So we need to work out why. Uh, that's a very easy way to demonstrate our um, conditional breakpoints. So you will say that if app type, so we have three types that we demo it's desktop, web, and mobile. So let's say I want to do a breakpoint on my uh, when it's desktop because you know it's not working. From here, and you can either right click or you can hit on the gear, add conditions, and you can see. Uh, I think there's an auto uh, condition as well, so you, type. so you can see Delsense picks up the stuff that you want to type, so it has full awareness of what you're trying to do. So we'll say condition when app type is. Type. So that means that this breakpoint will only execute when the app tag is desktop. And if I go back like that, close up there. You'll see there's a nice <coughs> cross over here that uh, signifies that you now have a, a filter on your breakpoint. If I execute again. <coughs> Decoding type is desktop, but we know that we have desktop apps, so why does not work? A very quick way, we know that we have the data here, so let me just clear that. Who knows they can do link into your debug windows now? So let's do a quick link statement. So we know that we have, so if you notice here in the immediate window, you get IntelliSense that works across the board. We can do a select. Is it too small for you guys to see, or? Yeah, it's pretty small. So, um, so I'll zoom into that. So if I zoom into this, what I'm saying is, get me all the app types from my code. So what happens? There you go. So we know that uh, we know what the problem is. Desktop is a lowercase, uppercase. So let's fix this. So we have equals here. So we can say sync comparison dot or not in our case. And I'm pretty sure if I step the code now, we will run some apps for me. That fixed it. Did somebody notice that we did edit and continue while we're editing stuff? Now this has uh, worked while we're debugging, but this has not been saved yet. You'll see that this file is still in a uh, dirty state. So you need to make sure that you save when you do edit and continue, otherwise you won't be able to save your changes or things won't work consistently. Uh, in the back into the, the filtering, let's remove that. There's uh, other options there as well. There's uh, conditions. You can do conditional ex expression as we did. There's also a hit count. So if you're doing iterations and you know that on the 1015th iteration you have an exception, you can put a hit point there and say when you do 1014 iterations stop, 
that's a lot faster than doing conditional exceptions because you don't have to uh, be evaluated every time you iterate through the loop. It will go directly and stop at the, that, that hitch. It's a lot faster. Filters are used for uh, multi-threading uh, functionality, so it's not applicable here. I'm jumping a bit here now with the uh, actions. Actions allow you to, to do trace points into your uh, application. So if you, if you have an iteration that builds something and you want to output that to your trace, 